Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Welcome. I am so excited today to talk about Christians Media, the public square. And I have the guest, Troy Miller, who's the president of the National Religious Broadcaster. And he has really turned this organization around in a tumultuous time where broadcasting is no longer there. And I remember just talking before this, before we started here, it's like, how did you, how are you, I just remember you guys doing radio, TV, and broadcasting. You're like, well, there isn't really that block anymore. So welcome, Troy. Uh, how are you? And if you could just tell a little bit about yourself and kind of how you really turned around this organization that you started leading in 2019. Well, first of all, it's good to be with you today. Thanks for having me on. Um, and it's been an interesting journey. You know, uh, God sometimes does things in your life uh, uh, that you don't expect. I never thought that I would be in Christian broadcasting to begin with, let alone leading uh, the world's largest association of Christian broadcasters. And as we say it today, Christian communicators. You know, oddly enough, NRB uh, uh, started 80 years ago, just, just two weeks ago on Sunday. Uh, group of broadcasters, radio folks, got together at Moody Church in Chicago uh, because they wanted to proclaim the gospel and disciple people over this new media called radio, this new medium. And uh, and there was a group out there that said, uh, no, we're going to decide who can be on from a religious aspect radio, how long they can be on, what they can say, just a real violation of those First Amendment rights. And so this group got together, formed the National Religious Broadcasters Association. And for 80 years, we've been fighting and advocating on behalf of Christian communicators today uh, to be in the public square, as you said, to do whatever ministry God has called them to do in the public square. We're out there fighting on their behalf to be in that. I, I started uh, as, a, as a Nebraska farm kid, um, a poor Nebraska farm kid, went to the Navy. The military was great to me. I was part of a naval engineering group that built the USS Bunker Hill down in Pascoola, Mississippi. Then I served on that ship in the Persian Gulf and just had a wonderful experience. Went into the tech industry. So tech is my background. That's I'm a more of a technology guy than anything. Worked for Gateway Computers for over 11 years. And then got the dream of my life is to work for D. James Kennedy, whose book, while I was in the Navy, my grandmother sent me his book, Why I Believe, and it was instrumental in bringing me to Christ. Um, that led me to his ministry, which led me to NRB TV in Nashville, Tennessee, which led me to the NRB in 2019. So that's my journey uh, in a nutshell. Wow. So, but probably your technical experience, because when you came on in 2019, um, the situation for Religious News Broadcasters Association wasn't doing so well. And I think it goes really back to what my book is talking about is this transformation of everything. The gatekeepers are no longer there. And and I used to work for an organization for David Aikman, former time uh, correspondent, working with people that had the religious belief of Christianity, and that could be uh, Protestant, Catholic, and within that span, on how do you stay ethical? Because we had this thing before called objectivity in the media. Mm -hmm. How do you stay objective, right? And so now everything has just gone into big soup. And how, do you, how did you navigate that in 2019? Yeah, you know, it's, it is interesting, again, how God orders our, our path. I always thought I wanted to be a pastor, and yet God spent more uh, over a decade training me as a business and technology person, which is what came in instrumental for NRB. You know, it was in a time when the organization had gotten off track on mission um, and certainly had gotten off track on business management and administration. So a lot of it was just rolling up your sleeves and, and going back to kind of the basics, uh, you, you know, 
and and uh, business fundamentals, but we really focused on our advocacy role. I think that was key for one of the things that we did uh, when I came on board was to get back to that advocacy role of understanding who NRB is, what our purpose is uh, for its members. That helped us grow our annual convention and our annual convention really helped write the organization back on the path. So there's two things we, we kind of worked really hard on was that basic business, getting back to our mission of advocating for our members and we're a Christian organization. We're the national religious broadcasters. We're not just broadcasters. We also focus back in on our message of the gospel and understanding that we're here to protect the gospel in the public uh, space. And in the as uh, uh, my good friend and and uh, one time NRB uh, chairwoman uh, Janet Parshall says, "In the marketplace of ideas." And so it, it was a real fundamental, just getting us back to that and working hard on that that aspect of who we are. And look, you're going to talk about, we're going to talk about this, I'm sure. We're in a time of a lot of opposition for broadcasters and for Christian communicators in general. So uh, that's a really good point. If you could tell me what is your mission and who are actually your audience right now? Because when I used to work with it, like with Gordon Govier, who's one of your members, uh, who's one of the parts of this organization, I work with David Aikman, uh, really was uh, very much radio and television and very constrict. That was my perception. And so how have you been able to minister? How have you been able to serve your clientele so that they have a voice in the public square? Yeah, you know, Christians have been one of the, the best groups, uh, Christian broadcasters and communicators to adopt new technologies and to try new technologies out. When uh, we were at NRB TV, when I was running NRB TV, we were actually the first television channel to get on Roku. Uh, we developed a, a, an IP addressing system that allowed us to deliver to this new streaming technology. And so we're seeing a lot of broadcasters today, as you said, television and radio was dominant for so many years and radio is still pretty dominant, but we're seeing so many broadcasters today start to embrace the new technologies, especially streaming for both video and audio. That's a big place. We're also seeing one of the other things we're really neat and what excites me about NRB is we're seeing a lot of the younger generation getting involved in, in communications podcasters and bloggers and YouTubers, um, people that have Instagram channels and even that thing called TikTok out there. Um, these young guys are using it for the proclamation of the gospel and for conservative, you know, values for those Judeo-Christian values uh, that has made the foundation of this company, country so good. So one of the things that we've done at NRB, and this helps with my technology background, is we've really invested helping our members understand what the technology trends are, what's going on, uh, what's going on right now. We're talking a lot, of course, what's going on in artificial intelligence, but how do you use this te technology um, for the betterment of your ministry? How do you do that in all these areas? So we hold a lot of webinars and we'll hold a lot of uh, sessions at our conference that are all about technology innovation and how do you get in the marketplace today? So a member, a mem so a person that could be part of NRB could be a podcaster, could be, uh, are you mostly focusing on churches then? Or is it what, more what, like individuals? What, like, uh, <laughs> just trying to understand. Sure. It's so broad right now. NRB is, right. like I said, so so we still have that core radio and television broadcasters. We have those radio and television program producers, but we also, because of the Christian, the way publishing went digital, so the Christian publishing industry kind of, you, you know, uh, almost came to a halt for a while. Now it's flourishing again, uh, and we've added all the Christian publishers because of their digital aspect as part of NRB. So we represent Christian publishers publishers and authors. Um, and as I said, we, we represent bloggers and podcasters. If you're on the digital network or you're trying to do something on social media, we have those folks. And then, as you said, a lot of churches, because every church streams today, especially after COVID. Matter of fact, we spent a lot of time during COVID 
helping educate churches how to stream properly and how to reach their audience and what were the tools that they could use to do that. So we have this very wide breadth of, of membership that we serve but they all have this commonality that they're all Christian communicators and they're all Christian uh, 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 ministries about the gospel. So that, that brings a commonality there. But it's really fun for us because we get to play in a lot of different verticals uh, and help people. But with the emergence of, of the whole digital age, there's so much crossover today. There's not a radio station today that doesn't also stream. There's not a television station that doesn't stream. And the reverse, this is the interesting thing, we've seen these really popular influencers on YouTube, let's say, or on podcasters that have found out to expand their audience, they've moved back in traditional broadcasting and we've helped that transition as well. That's interesting. So when you go into traditional broadcasting, what would that mean? Would it mean going back to some of the old Christian stations then? Is that how it would work? Or yeah. uh, that would be really interesting to understand. Yeah, so some of the podcasters, you know, so podcasting's a little more freeform, so podcasters, you know, maybe they were doing a 40-minute podcast, or maybe they were doing a, uh, just a 15-minute podcast, and we've helped podcasters figure out, let's let's figure out how to form your podcast so you can take it into traditional radio, so it can go back into some of the larger Christian radio station groups. Um, and we've seen them do that. Same thing with television. How do you take your YouTube content, your video video blog, your video podcast, and turn that into a tool that works on television. There, there's a couple of groups. There's a group that does this uh, called Cross Politic. Uh, they had a very good podcast. They were growing. All of a sudden, they moved back. They came to us and said, help us go to TV. They saw their podcast grow by almost 30% when they came on TV because TV helped them uh, get noticed in an audience they weren't reaching. And how do you, but it's still hard to get into television, isn't it? It's like uh, the, the barrier to entry, at least when I was younger, it was like television is here, right? And that's one of the reasons why podcasting, blogging, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing blogging is like just informing people on the issues that I really believe in. Uh, but how do you, how do you, so like say if you want to be a syndicated radio person, right? So you're a podcast person and you're like, oh, I would love to be on radio. How would you actually do that? Yeah, so there's a so there's a number of organizations, and we can help with that as well. Okay, uh, uh, how to do that? How to how to walk you through those steps to do that? And as you said, I mean, it, it all comes down to first of all, do you have a really good podcast? A really good content? Content is always. Right. I, I love Rupert Murdoch's comment uh, when he sold Directv. He said, you, "You've heard the phrase content is king. I'm here to tell you, it's the emperor of all things. Um, oh, and, yeah. and and content really is." Uh, uh, you need to do quality, but there's some great quality content out there. Um, and these radio stations are looking for good, solid content, especially Christian content. Um, and now with the digital age, some radio stations have multiple channels that they're broadcasting on, and they also have their radio broadcast, and then they have additional streaming channels. So there's a lot of opportunity beyond just uh, your doing your own individual podcast or your own individual YouTube channel. It's interesting you say that. Um, is it happening like publishing where right now self-publishing is really making an inroads and you have different kinds of self-publishing offers? Like I have a publishing company, but it's kind of like a hybrid. So we, we help people that we believe in. You have to apply for it. But you're the one that's actually the author is actually footing part of the bill. We have like a 50-50 thing. So when you're going to go into broadcasting or when you're going to go into syndicated, has the pricing model changed where you actually go in almost like a producer and a production company and then you're also actually paying to get that, that spot? Or is it where they're inviting you into the spot and it's sponsors? So the neat thing about today is we're not in this one model uh, scenario anymore because the distribution has, you know, and honestly, this is a problem in the industry somewhat. The distribution has become so wide in so many avenues that the revenue model has had to follow that and, and, and come across on different ways. So there, there are options for you to, as you said, in traditional Christian television to buy in, to, to underwrite your airtime to get into that there 
There are options for, you know, revenue shares today uh, to do that. And then there are, especially on the TV, that what they call these fast channels, free ad supported television. And there's options to go in and do splits on the ads uh, for stations that are commercial uh, in there. And that's where the that's where we're seeing the growth because they need the content. They need good quality content. And think about it. If you bring a podcaster into your radio network, this is a person that already has probably established a very large audience out there. So you're bringing in a, a big uh, audience base, a big advertising base in from the beginning. So it's not like it was 10 or 20 years ago when you were trying to start into radio and you had no base. You were just trying to get in. You were a ministry starting. Uh, maybe the only base you had was your church. These podcasters today have already proven themselves on the digital side. Now they're coming into the airwave side and they're bringing that audience and they, they're bringing that built in almost marketing team with them. Oh, that's so interesting. That must, yeah, and you're right. You're really, your, your audience right now is Christian communicators. It's really about people wanting to go out there and communicate. And then that span. That, that must be very exciting for you. So how do you actually serve each of these components? Because it's radio, it's television, it's bloggers, it's podcasters. Do you have a criteria for people to be a member? Do you have to have that many followers? Or how does that actually become a member in, in, in your association? Yeah, it, it's really about the mission statement and what you're about as an organization. It's not so much about uh, whether you're how big you are. We we have organizations from uh, single individuals all the way up yeah. to you know multi-station groups and multi-digital groups uh, out there. So we really represent little guys all the way up to to big organizations, very large organizations. The the key is for us is a, it's just about are you a Christian broadcaster? Is what you're doing is Christian. So we have a statement of faith and a code of ethics. And if you align with that, then, you know, NRB is here. I'll go back to your first question, though, too. We have had to adapt as an organization of how we do our advocacy, because oh, for, really? the okay. for the longest period of time, the main advocacy for this organization was really in, in the governmental sector. So keeping an eye on the legislation that was coming through, watching the regulatory environment to make sure that they were, you know, friendly to to not only broadcasting, but in specific to Christian broadcasting. And so for most of NRB's life, that's where NRB focused in on was what was going on in the halls of Congress, what's going on at the Federal Communications Commission, sometimes what was going on at other regulatory, government regulatory uh, areas. That is not the case anymore. We we still do that. That is one of the ways, one of the primary ways we still advocate for our members out there is watching those government uh, areas. We're watching a number of bills right now that are that are proposed in Congress, and we're watching regulatory items still in the Federal Communications Commission. But because business is so broad today, now we have to follow the Federal Trade Commission because they have oversight over the internet and digital and edge providers. We have to watch what's going on in the labor department because with a lot of the different policies on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and other things, we're seeing you know regulations come down that would uh, prohibit Christians from doing uh, business the way that they want to do business or, or ministry. So we have to watch all of these regulatory environments. And of course, today we're also watching the courts and we are involved in the courts. We currently have two lawsuits underway. One suing the Federal uh, Communications Commissions over some new changes they want to do on uh, uh, diversity reporting out of stations. And two, uh, we're suing the IRS on what's called the Johnson Amendment, and that's a free speech inhibit on pastors being able to talk about uh, candidates. So we're watching those. But here's the big area that we're really on, and that's corporate America. So for the longest time, corporate America was kind of, for the most part, neutral. 
uh, in the marketplace, uh, in the public square. Now corporate America uh, is not is no longer neutral. So we've seen these companies take on anti-Christian policies. Uh, we see the social media companies out there, the new mediums of communication uh, that have uh, adopted these um quote unquote community standards that have prohibited or canceled Christians from talking about certain messages. So we're working very hard now in the corporate sector. We're, we're starting to make inroads into what I, a big push for me is into the, what I call the C-suites of the major companies. So in there and talking about with the CEOs and the chief operating officers and the chief marketing officers. So they understand how large this Christian audience is out there and when they make these policies what they're really affecting uh, the, the the effect of those policies are going to be so that's a huge part for us and then the last uh, area that we've really gotten into and that's the mainstream media um, because mainstream media today as you said journalism for the most part is dead uh, mainstream media unfortunately is a lot of propaganda and it's propaganda for the most part against Christians and the values and the things that Christians believe in. So let me ask you this. So how do you define Christian? So can someone that's cath of a Catholic faith join NRB or is it is it is it very much and like uh, I, I, I went to Wheaton College so I kind of have like the, the lingo down but most a lot of my listeners don't. Um, how do you define Christian? Because uh, that's a that's a difficult I would say is quite a challenging one. I mean I know the National Prayer Breakfast with the fellowship has defined it very neutral oriented but it would be great to have the listeners understand what is your definition of that yeah and our, and our if you read our statement of faith our statement of faith is is very broad because even within let's just talk about protestant and catholic for a second even within the protestant uh, uh arena you have a number of different denominations and and beliefs um nrb focuses more on the protestant evangelical side uh of of christian broadcasters and communicators but we do a lot of work and partner with our uh catholic uh brothers and sisters out there because there are already a lot of Catholic organizations that, that do this kind of advocacy and so we've worked with them especially on the pro-life movement. We've had Father Pavone was an NRB member for a number of years. Um, I was just recently in New York and met with a number of Catholic leaders uh, to talk about uh, issues that are important to both of us so so we're we're not limited in, in, in the fact of who we'll work with and in the partnership wise but as an organization and a membership, we are clearly Christian evangelical. So um, this is going to probably be a little bit controversial, but I used yes. to work for Senator Hatch, who was Mormon, and they, they uh, and I worked in the office, they believe them they're Christian, and they never understood why the other side didn't believe they were. And so um, how do you deal with that, like someone that's actually identifying themselves as Christian, but yet might not fit into the organization or do you well, partner again, with them or how do you work with that that's a very again our, sta our, our statement of faith kind of limits that those okay. groups because okay. because the mormons have the book of mormon and we we right. hold just to the just, christian okay. scriptures so there's there's okay. there's good lines there but but again when it comes to common issues uh that we can work especially for freedom of religion and, and here's where we stand on this we fight for freedom of religion period the First Amendment says that the Congress shall make no law, you know, limiting uh, or respecting religion and, win, and the free exercise thereof. And so we fight for that freedom of religion. And I'll tell you why, because we feel like in the marketplace, it doesn't matter whether you're a evangelical, Protestant, Christian, uh, whether you're a Mormon, whether you're a, a Muslim, whether you're a Catholic, we believe that the that the the our belief as what we believe as evangelical Christians that we can have that dialogue and 
should have that dialogue in the marketplace. Okay, it shouldn't be government making those rules. So we believe that Christianity can stand up and we can talk to to Muslims about it and what Christianity believes and and the differences between Islam and Christianity or the differences between Christian Mormonism and Christian evangelicalism or Catholics and and Protestants. That should happen in the public square. It shouldn't be driven by some government laws, government regulations. It should happen in the public square. And I think that common ground is what brings us together. Yeah, and it's really about how much can we communicate on the public ground and how are we interpreting that we're being discriminated against because some people say maybe we're too sensitive or, uh, and how do you, and that's very interesting how you are challenging because you're kind of representing the silent majority of the United States. Isn't it like 80 or 60% of Americans are evangelical or Protestants or in that block? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. About 80% of Americans will profess a belief in God, um, that they believe in, in, in God, that there's a, a God, the a creator. Um, about, I think the number is somewhere around 40% of those, uh, or so are evangelicals, um, in, in this, in this country. And so it's a huge block of, of people. It's a huge block of, that go to church every week, um, and live out their Christian face. So yeah, we are in in a sense representing that silent kind of group out there. Wow, that's um uh, and so uh right now we're in we're in the election uh and just a few weeks out uh when this gets released. Um what how do you navigate that? Like so uh because you are so much in as association making sure laws are accommodating to your to your client or to your target how do you manage uh, that public square in an election? Are you like the labor union endorsing a candidate? Are you not endorsing a candidate? How are you navigating that component? Yeah, well, like I said earlier, unfortunately, as a 501c3 organization under the IRS code, we can't endorse, directly endorse, or oppose candidates, but we can work on educating people on what the key issues are uh, of this election cycle and what the key policy decisions that will be made by whatever administration gets into uh, the White House, the Congress, the regulatory environments, and all the way down through the state levels, you know, uh, we tell people, look, don't don't just think of, you know, these national uh, races for the presidency. Remember that there are school board races that are probably going to have a greater impact on your life uh, than some things that might come out of the White House or out of the Capitol building. So we help educate educate people on that. And that's a big issue today. We wrote a recent op-ed um, about the the lack of voter Christian Christians participating in the election process. Nearly uh, 40% of Christians, 37% of Christians didn't participate in the last election cycle. And even worse than that is, is about 50% of Christians, over 50% of Christians said they, did, they weren't even, they couldn't even articulate what the key issues were during this uh, during the election cycle or following the key issues of our time today and so that really brings a challenge for us as Christian communicators and Christian broadcasters to to work harder to make sure we're communicating those issues and quite frankly I, I make it as a call a challenge to the pastors across this country um, that should be really ashamed that their congregations do don't know what the key issues of the culture uh, is cultures are facing today. What, what uh, that's, I, I've heard that before. And it's like, you don't really believe that, but why do you think that is, is it because we are afraid of the politics or is it like, is it or like the notion in the Bible that says be of the world and not of it. So it almost becomes like this, I don't want to say cultish thing, but you're in this community where you're just insular into your life and you're not really being taught to engage. Cause like I went to Wheaton college, which was very much, uh, it's a Christian college, liberal arts, very much about you need to engage in politics and culture and everything you are a civic citizen how is it that christians have left civic citizen out of their faith 
Well, I, I think there's a couple of reasons because, as, as you know, if you look back at the history of this country, it was it was Christian faith that drove them into the civics part of the country, uh, not the other way around. Um, and it's why we have a First Amendment out there is because there were Christians who really understood that the culture um, was really about how, how uh, the country was going to be governed uh, in the future. So, so I think we've seen over the last several decades this very concerted effort on behalf of the progressives and the left to really make politics seem like something that is shameful for a Christian to be involved in. And so we've seen recently the rise of this whole terminology of Christian nationalism, you know, uh, you know, the Christian nationalism is going to take over. Christians shouldn't be nationalist. Christians are going to force people on what they believe. It's, it's really, it, it, it's, it's all smoke and mirrors because if you think about it, tell me what political group out there you couldn't attach the word nationalism to. LGBTQ nationalism because they're forcing their beliefs, their policies, and their practices on everybody else? Is it is it secular nationalism because they want to, uh, again, force their beliefs, their worldview on everybody else? So you could take every political thing out there and attach that word to it, but somehow they've used it to shame Christians to not be involved in this sector, and they've misquoted scriptures uh, out there, or they've, they've used scriptures to sort of proof text uh, their their ideology here, their their beliefs. So they say things like, well, like like you said, and and it's very true. Christians, we live in this tension between we are not uh, of this world, but we're in this world. And yet, you look at the Apostle Paul, you look at Christianity over the the two two thousand years of it. Christians have influenced every culture they've ever gone into, and they've always influenced it for the better. They've ended practices, barbaric pagan practices, everywhere they've they've gone into. And so, this idea that Christians should somehow just take a back seat when it comes to government and it comes to who's going to govern the country is ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous to think of that because, look, policies today, governmental policies today, they're driving now, they're, they're driving uh, LGBTQ policies into elementary schools. We're seeing government policies that are dr driving transgenderism into middle schools and elementary schools. We're seeing government policies today that are, are affecting our pro-life view. We have government policies today that are defining whether there are only two genders, male and female. We're seeing government policies that drove what marriage is uh, today. All of those were driven by government policies, and they were driven by people who were, for the most part elected and so christians we're to, we're out there with a the message that it's our it's our christian duty to be involved in the public sector and as christians we don't have to set down and give up the right to have our christian view be the views that govern the policies govern the legislation and govern the way money is spent in this country so it's really um what you're saying there's a war of ideas and maybe, maybe, um, maybe one of the reasons why they're not involved, and maybe I wouldn't be surprised if there's like a, a same group, because I remember when I was a waitress, this was during the election of Clinton versus Dole, right when I got out of college, um, mm -hmm. I remember I was on, the one person, the only person of this restaurant of 50 people that voted, right? And I... I was conservative and they were liberal, right? So my vote was basically the one that counted all those 50 people that were not voting. So there is this block of, of on the other side as well. And it just maybe yeah. seems that people don't want to be in this war. It's like, you don't like, I don't talk about my politics or my views. Like I used to have on my Facebook where I could dialogue on viewpoints, right? Cause I loved having that kind of dialogue, but you really, can't have that anymore because of the um, the sensitivity, the vitriol, the, because it seems like the war that has weapons outside of the country, that war is now of words. 
And it seems that we're in this battle. And maybe that's one of the reasons why we are seeing a lack of engagement on both sides. Yeah, I, I think that's very valid. I think that, that that a lot of people, you know, look, people for the most part shy away from conflict and people don't yeah. like conflict. And rather than, and, and we've become so polarized today that issues that we could debate and still walk away and be friends uh, today ha- have become issues that, like, if you hold that view, I, I can't even talk to you. I can't even have you in my life. It's just, it's just amazing to me how polarized... Um, uh, we've become on these and, and honestly how hateful uh, some of them have become. But I, I, I think that we have to push back against that. That can't be our excuse for not getting involved because all that has led to, in my opinion, is more polarization and deeper polarization. But I find out to de- find today, even when I, I was teaching young college kids, so kids would come back to church, they'd come back from mainly secular, uh, you know, college and stuff and we'd start to talk about ideas and to talk about them just in a rational way they were like oh I never thought of that I didn't think of that I only heard my professor say this side of it that's a really good point and when you could get past saying look I understand you hold that view Um, I have a different view that doesn't mean I don't still love you and care about you uh, and still want to go, you know, have a meal with you or go out and, and, and have some coffee, you know, with you and just talk about sports or something else. Um, that's the kind of thing we have to get back to, the fact that we can hold different ideologies, different worldviews, still like each other. But if we don't have those conversations, we're just going to be we're going to be an extremely polarized, hateful country. Uh, it's so, I, I totally, I, I could totally see that and how, that's why I liked, I don't know if you saw the vice presidential debate, but to me, I really thought that was a step towards civic, civilized debate. I really felt like I really learned both sides in a very constructive way. They were able to disagree. They were fighting in a sense, but it was with such, um, I don't know, such grace, respectfulness. I was really... For me, that gave hope. I don't know what you thought. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with that. I, I, you looked back and thought maybe we step back in time there a little bit. Here's, right. here's, here's two people. They're debating ideas, oftentimes ideas that are on very, very, very apart on the spectrums of, of belief here. Uh, but we saw some compassionate moments there as well. We saw, you, you know, one candidate say, "I'm sorry, I didn't know that about you." I, I feel, you know, and those kinds of things. And and I, I thought that was very refreshing. And I hope we could see and more people would see that as a model of how things can work. Yeah. And so kind of like now, kind of coming to a close, I'd love to know a little bit more about you. You've been very much in this technical and kind of like, where do you see things are going with AI and, and all of the various we're, we're in a revolution. Like we don't, we don't even know we're going to land yet. If that's just my point of view, I don't know what you think, but uh, what are you, what are you seeing some of the tea leaves, some of the trends and having been in such varied experiences and now being the leader of this organization? Well, for, first of all, let me let me say I, I am very optimistic about the time we live in because we live in a, in one of the greatest points of history for communication. We can communicate now around the world, around this globe, instantly. You know, we can be this conversation of your yours and I can be in India. You know, the minute you publish it, it can be in China. It can be everywhere around the world uh, accessible. So we live in a great time for communication. We also live in a time when it's easy um, to get into communications. Practically everybody today has a social media account on one platform or another uh, for for almost no cost. Uh, we have the devices to do it today. So communicating is a, it's a great time to be a communicator, um, but you have to be intentional about it and not just uh, you know out there trying to be a populist, uh, you know, to say I, I, you know all about my popularity. Um, you know, 
get into communications on a deeper level. Now, the technology is, again, like you said, we're kind of in a place right now where innovation is happening so fast, none of us look down the road and with any clarity to say we know exactly what's going on. Man has always used technology for good and used it for evil. And so n none of this is going to be any different. AI has some wonderful, exciting uh, things and aspects into it. One of the stuff it's doing in the healthcare industry is amazing. The fact that cancer now uh, that used to go to a lab the pathology to be diagnosed against a few hundred cancers can now be diagnosed by an AI model against millions of cancers so that your treatment can be very targeted for your specific diagnosis is incredible use of, of technology to help people. But at the same time, AI is creating deep fakes and, and, and creating horrible things that are ruining people's lives. And that really just goes back to the heart of people and the uh, heart of man and why it really comes back to, for us as Christians, it's all about the gospel message of Christ, the hope that the gospel brings and the change of people's hearts that it brings. We are going to do our best to see that technology is used for good reasons and we're going to point out where it's used for evil. Yeah, that's a really good point. So if you uh, look at your life, um, uh, I always say, what is, your <laughs> what is your selfish purpose and what is your selfless purpose, right? So we all want to save the world. So like at, when you come to the end of your life, what do you want to be known for uh, from a personal standpoint and from more from a bigger standpoint? Well, look, it's an honor and a privilege to be the CEO, President CEO of the National Religious Broadcasters. Uh, it's not something I ever sought out or ever thought uh, that I would be in uh, to work on behalf of all of these ministries that God has called for all kinds of different purposes um, and to ensure that they can continue to do what they do is 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 exciting and humbling all at the same time. Some, sometimes I'm like, I don't know where I came from a Nebraska farm boy to be here. Um, but God has a, a good sense of humor. Um, I just would love to be known as this was a faithful servant of Christ. That's my both my personal and my professional uh, aspirations to say, uh, here is a man that was a faithful servant of Christ, and I don't need to really be known for anything other than that. And, and, and maybe a good husband and a good father. I have four wonderful kids. They're all adopted. God gave us a put our family together. Um, I have four wonderful children, and uh, th those are the things that I'd, I'd personally like to be known for. I'd love to ask you, this is really interesting, you were a farm, poor farm boy. How did you, if you look back on your life, how did you go from farm boy to where you are? What are some lessons that you would impart? I'd love to, I know I'm going off on a tangent there, but that is such an amazing story. <laughs> Yeah, you know what I'll tell people is is that you know the scripture tells us that that we make plans and God orders our steps. Uh, and 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 again, I, I thought I was going to grow up following the footsteps of my grandfather, be a part time farmer and a policeman. That was my that was my goal in life. Um, when I found out that that the military will let you hold guns and shoot things with glasses, but the uh, police will not, um, uh, that changed my whole path. And, and trajectory. What, I, what I'll tell people just on a short note is wherever you're at today, don't assume that you're in the wrong place. I, I didn't think that 10 years at a technology company was going to have any impact on the Christian world at all. I didn't think it was going to do anything. I thought I was wasting my time um, working at this organization, yet God had a plan that two decades later, he was going to use all those skills to rescue an organization that needed desperately needed rescuing and so wherever you're at today understand that god may be preparing you for something a decade two decades down the road and the and the second thing i tell to people uh, i never in all of my career ever uttered these words 
That's not in my job description. Uh, I did whatever needed to be done um, to get the job done for the organization that was paying me to do that. And and I walked through every door that God opened up, prayed about it. And then when God opened the door, even if I didn't see it, I walked through that door. And so if you're out there today and you're looking at your career and thinking you don't know where you're at, just remember, you, you can't see the future. God's training you today. If you really trust and believe, that he's in your life and Jesus said then lo I'll be with you always then understand where you're at today is is where he wants you to be um, and you may not see the fruit of that for a decade or two Wow thank you so much uh, so what uh, what we will do then thank you this is a very insightful uh, discussion really about technology kind of like how important it is for all of us to be in the public square and to defend the rights uh, to really take the First Amendment seriously. But also, again, you know, in anything we do, just listen to the still small voice in your heart and, uh, and talk with people and move forward. And you never know where you're going to be, kind of like you. <laughs> and so, so what I would love to do is I would love to have, um, so we're going to put some links down for, for, for the listeners. I'd love to have the op-ed. I'd love to have the book that influenced you, uh, that you mentioned uh, in the beginning, and then just where we can find you. And also, if you are a Christian and a communicator and you want to be part of something bigger, um, join the, um, the Religious News Broadcasters Association, because that's a very good place for gathering. And I think right now with COVID and all this stuff, actually meeting people is so important. And I think something like an organization where you can come together, break bread, listen, and be with each other, see each other. I think it's it's a wonderful thing that you're doing. So thank you. Well, thanks for having me today. You can follow us at nrb.org. Okay. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at nrbceo. Um, and... Um, on, on Twitter, but you can; those two will get you everything that we're doing. But we'll get oh, you; we'll get you those other that other information. Well, thank you so much. This was lovely. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keeping bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry. Keep shining, and see you next time.